Good morning, welcome to this week's Grow, where we gather to recharge, organize, and work here as members of MWIC. We're, well, we're glad that you're joining us, um, either here on the Zoom or watching the recording um, after. This week, we are talking about having meaningful conversations, and if you have um, been watching the last few weeks, we've been talking about our summer program um, called the HOPE Experiment, and um, that is something that MWIC has put together for our members to work on. And I'm just going to ask Catherine Esslinger, because she's in the thick of it, to talk about, we've talked about it in some past grows, but just to kind of remind people what the HOPE experiment is. So Catherine, if you want to talk about that for a minute. Yes, I would love to. So the HOPE experiment is our summer program where we're trying to help our members and their friends and relatives to find ways to increase their hope. And some of the ways that we that we are encouraging members to do that is by connecting with others, um, by uh, learning more about their community, becoming involved in their community, uh, building their uh, spiritual hope as well through uh, through listening to our Proclaimed Peace podcast or reading our um, Sabbath devotionals. So we think that one of the big ways that we can become more hopeful is by um, connecting with our friends and neighbors and relatives and uh, by doing uh, doing that through meaningful conversations, conversations that go just a little bit deeper than the surface level of where you might be spending a lot of your time conversing. And so that's why we uh, we have included that as a component in our HOPE experiment. And so we have a lot of different ways that we're using meaningful uh, conversations in the HOPE experiment. We have some scheduled living room conversations, which is something that MWAG partners with, and we hold those every month. We hold several every month, and we have some coming up this. We still have one in June, and we have two in July scheduled. Um, and we can talk more about those specifically a little bit later, but we also want to encourage you to have those meaningful conversations just in casual settings. And we have a few tips and tools and experiences that we want to share about how that works and how to make it work, because it does seem kind of scary sometimes to, to leap in in that way, in a, in a different way. Yeah. And just before we started to grow, um, as we were kind of waiting for everybody to join. We were talking about how those conversations, how we, when we ask questions to people, how those conversations lead to, they can lead to friendships, they lead to understanding. And in in some of the cases we were talking about it, um, I was able to share some information with people about MWEG. So it's, it's a really great, it's just a great way to kind of share some insight and maybe things that are meaningful to you. Um, so today for our grow, we have Jane Anderson joining us. She is a, I believe the the proper title is a conversation host um, who helps, as Catherine was talking about our living room conversations that MWAG um, uh, has scheduled. Those events, there's usually about five or six people maybe um, um, in those calls. And Jane is one of the facilitators for that. So she kind of keeps it on track and asks the questions and, and makes sure that everybody uh, gets to share. So I'm going to turn the time over to Jane and she's going to talk to us about having meaningful conversations and how, how we can do that and why it's important. So um, when I heard that within the scope of volunteer opportunities for MWEG that there was an opportunity to learn about living room conversations, I jumped at the chance um, because I live in Arizona and I, in the last eight, 10 years, have found myself in some difficult conversations and I didn't always navigate those conversations very successfully. And so um, I, number one, wanted to increase my skills and number two, um, wanted to learn how I could teach those skills to my friends and also to my family, because I feel like youth these days don't necessarily have opportunities or unless they're really deliberate and create those, the opportunity is more to go to your silo and to listen to your echo chamber than it is to engage with people that have difference. Um, so I'll just give kind of a brief outline of what a living room conversation is in case people haven't attended one. Um, there is absolute structure in this conversation. So any living room conversation you go to will have certain key elements that are the same, no matter what conversation you, you attend. Um, 
Number one, uh, it starts out and it, uh, the conversation hosts will welcome everyone. But the first thing that they talk about um, are ground rules. And so every conversation, no matter what the topic is, will have a number of ground rules. Um, and so as I go through and share a little bit about the conversation process, I'm also going to let you know personally, when I'm not in those structured living room conversations, what I do to incorporate those principles into my own life. So some of those ground rules include um, showing respect and suspending judgment. Um, it could be um, being authentic and welcoming that from others. Uh, one of the ground rules is that everyone takes a turn and we don't interrupt. Uh, and so it's really interesting, just as I've thought about when I enter conversations, do I have my own personal ground rules that I establish? If I know that I'm going to have an encounter with someone where I've maybe had a heated conversation in the past, do I take the time, um, kind of following the example of this living room conversation to make my own ground rules? Like what are um, certain ways that I want to conduct myself in this conversation so that it's productive, that it's not a right, wrong, zero sum outcome. Um, and there's a talk that I keep coming back to as I've done this um, conversation host role um, by Elder Renlin called The Peace of Christ Abolishes Enmity. And I'll read a couple quotes from that today, but one of the quotes is, if we're unable to place our discipleship to Jesus Christ above personal interest and viewpoints, we should re-examine our priorities and change. So I think, you know, those ground rules are important. Um, when you enter that conversation, are you, you know, again, are you going with the intent to win or are you going with the intent to learn? So ground rules is one thing you'll see in that living room conversation. Um, the second thing that you'll see in every living room conversation is you will have a little portion that's basically like a get to know you piece. So there's the same three questions that participants are asked to answer. I think one of them that I love is, you know, what would your best friend say about you? And everyone in that who's attending the conversation gets to go around for a couple minutes and share that. Um, it makes, it reminds me um, of a friend of mine, Melanie Tagg, who's the director of the Venn Diagram Project um, back in Virginia. And that project seeks to bring together people to talk about difficult conversations. And I heard her say once that in this work of finding common ground or having hard conversations, she said, find common humanity first. And so the, the point of having those get to know you questions is to establish that we're all multidimensional people um, that we need to declassify, decategorize people. Um, it also makes me think of um, a lot of us have watched the movie that was about uh, the Boston Globe's amazing piece about the secret friendship between pro-life and pro-choice um, advocates. Um, and those hard conversations would only be entered into once there was trust established. So they did things like sharing a meal um, and getting to know each other. Uh, so personally, how does this apply? I think, do I enter in hard conversations, seeing that person as a whole person, trying to see the humanity in that person, or am I just seeing the yard sign that I disagree with, or the social media posts that I roll my eyes at? Um, how well do I know this person? And can I allow the person I'm having the conversation with to be a whole person, and not just a list of their positions? So we start with the ground rules, we have the get to know you period. After that, um, each conversation subject will then delve into um, its specific area. So there'll be a quote that's read to kind of prompt some thought. And then there's a list of questions, usually five to six questions um, that people will then answer. And what's interesting is one of the rules is everyone gets a chance to speak. And so there's no crosstalk. And there's something really value about, about that. Um, I know I was doing a conversation, I was a conversation host um, about the topic of the environment about which I know very, very little. So I was a little bit reserved about thinking, am I capable to enter into this conversation? But one thing you should also note when we get to this round where people share um, an answer to a question, 
is that what's really valued in a living room conversation experience is that the qualification to engage is someone's own experience. Now that does not mean that, you know, we're going to buy into this, you know, death of expertise that we don't need anyone to be an expert and we just go off of how we feel about something and suddenly we're an armchair expert. That's not really the point. The point is, is that it's exploring the truth that my own lived experience are going to paint my perspective. And so acknowledging that reality that if I was raised in this state here, I might have a different experience than someone who's raised overseas here. Um, and the, it gives an opening for anyone to participate in these conversations because we all have had experiences dealing with race issues or guns or um, political contention or whatever the topic may be. So I love the idea that I can bring my lived experience and that has value. So a second quote I wanted to share from Elder Renlund's talk, which this is the one that I just keep coming back to over and over and over. He said, we need to assume that those with whom we disagree are doing the best they can with the life experiences they have. How amazing is that? Just to sit and think about that, that everyone's really doing the best they can, but I tend to like say, how could they think that, you know, but I just have to remember, I've had a different experience than they have had. And once you take the, the chance to kind of think about, hey, if I've had that experience, maybe my, my perspective or my point of view might be different. So in that round where everyone shares an answer, everyone gets to share their own experience. Um, the other thing that's really great about that is the conversation method is structured not to um, allow us to make our points, but really it's encouraging us to practice listening. So it makes, it allows us to like not enter those hard conversations with like the checklist of points I'm gonna make. And I, you know, if I really articulate these well, then that other person is gonna change their mind. That's not the point of the conversation. Um, it's not meant to alter positions, but it's help. It's meant to help us better understand why they believe what they believe. And, and it can also illuminate why we believe what we believe. And it encourages those participants to lean into curiosity um, rather than leading out with certainty. It brings that kind of humility that I might not understand why that person has that position. And I might not even understand the position. Um, so I love that these conversations do that. And I can certainly do this in my own life. Um, I, <laughs> I've had some periods where I have been pretty certain about things. And so when I enter in some of these hard conversations, I am absolutely not going in wanting to listen. Um, but if I am humble and I try to say, I don't, this isn't about any of us convincing the other person and it's just about listening, I feel like I can do that. And I can do that in a way where I'm less defensive. Um, and I don't change my position oftentimes, but I at least can have a better understanding why someone might have theirs. Um, and then a, just a final point, uh, as I've been a part of living room conversations, is that being comfortable in difficult conversations is absolutely a skill that has to be studied and practiced. It does not come naturally for a lot of us. I think as women, a lot of times we don't like conflict. And so we'd rather just kind of not talk about hard things than potentially bring about conflict. And all of us have had these really hard conversations that really don't go well. And so my encouragement to everyone that's listening is if that's how you feel, which is how most of us feel, then practice then learn about what these te techniques are and, and, and get in some of these conversations so you can hear how to navigate these paths. Um, there's so much that's outside of our control right now in our world. And I have found that we can make a difference locally within our families, neighborhoods, church communities. Um, and that's where I feel like we're avoiding that right now those hard spaces that are closest to home. But what if we made those hard spaces closest to home of higher import 
and we decided we're going to invest in this. We need that connection and we can absolutely lead out in, in making those spaces that matter. Uh, there's a great organization called More in Common, and they are basically a research think tank that looks at, um, you know, the trends towards polarization and how we can actually discover that we have more in common. And they recently did a report about engaging across difference. And that report showed that 72% of Americans agree that we have a responsibility and there's also interest in engaging with people that are different than us. But despite that very high level of desire, um, only like 25% or sorry, 40% say that they actually do that? Um, and the answer is, well, why don't they? Number one, exhaustion. I mean, that is, can, can as we as women relate to that exhaustion? Like we have so much on our plate. I don't wanna even think about talking to this neighbor that I've had this conversation with 10 times. I'm exhausted, I don't wanna do it. The other one is we just don't have the opportunity. So that's a very real issue, um, whether that's socioeconomic difference, racial differences, religious differences, we do tend to kind of congregate in our own circles. So these types of structured conversations can give us the opportunity to solve both of those barriers because we can maybe meet up with people that we wouldn't otherwise to have those conversations and, and get up the courage and decide that we're gonna invest in those opportunities and recognize that it's worth our time. It's worth our time to have the skills, to have those conversations um, because peacemaking isn't going to happen in a vacuum. Peacemaking is an active thing that only happens when you have different groups that come together. So avoiding that conflict, it's not gonna solve anything. Um, I'm just a huge proponent of having these difficult conversations, researching these skills, and then not just going to like a living room conversation, but having it with the neighbor, having it with the ward member, the cousin, that's really important. It shows number one, we care about that relationship. We care enough to have a difficult conversation. And so I'm just really grateful to be a part of it. And I'll take any questions or I guess any um, thoughts. So we actually have Becca Curl, who is the executive director of Living Room Conversations with us. And she's going to talk a little bit um, about that. And you might recognize her. She uh, was the recent guest on the Proclaim Peace podcast that MWEG um, does with Faith Matters. So I'm going to turn a little bit of time over to her and then we can do some questions. Well, number one, unmute yourself before you start talking. <laughs> um, I'll just take a couple minutes. I, I love how you were setting everything up, Jane, and how you talked about living room conversations. Um, we know that conversations create connection and connection is what allows us to be active peacemakers. It's what allows us to generate trust you know, within our own circles and within our communities and ultimately and hopefully within our country. And that's one of the things that we're really focused on this year is a trust in elections campaign. So we have this initiative where we're hoping that in local communities, people use our trust in elections guide. So again, you're practicing the skills that Jane mentioned. It's an opportunity for you to, to lean in and be able to practice and bring more people into the conversation. I think something that I found is the election is everywhere. Everyone is talking about it, but we're not having a conversation about it. And so um, we have, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to just have the conversation. Um, and we're also partnering. We have some research partners out of uh, Cooney and Loyola University who are, uh, who have helped us be able to provide some stipends. So Anyone who participates in the conversation can get a $10 gift card and it's to, you know, a coffee shop type place of your choice. And the idea is once you've invited people into the conversation, you can keep the conversation going over coffee, tea, hot chocolate, whatever your beverage of choice is. Um, and we're also partnering with organizations like MWEG to very intentionally point towards your resources. So this know your vote, grow your vote 
campaign is linked on our website and within our resources. So we're saying, yes, a conversation is a really critical part. It helps you to practice the skills that you need for peacemaking and to bridge differences. It also um, can kind of give you that foundation of trust to be able to do more active work. And I know you have great suggestions um, and recommendations for ways people can take action and engage together. So it's a good starting point. So I'll stop. I can, I saw that you just dropped a link in. I can also drop a link in to the specific trust and elections page on our website. Um, so that if you want to try something out and have one of these conversations, then you can also get a bonus $10 gift card and help us with the research project. So hopefully it's a win-win for everyone. And Catherine, did you want to talk about the upcoming living room conversations that MWAG is hosting? Um, I know we have one on June 26th. Yes, I do want to talk about those. I also just wanted to briefly um, give some suggestions of how you could casually do a, a, without having an, a, a complete living room conversation, but how you could casually drop these into your your just everyday interactions. And um, one of the one of the great ways of of doing that is to like what's been your experience with, and then whatever is a. a, a a uh, high interest topic in your community. Like what's been your experience with like the cost of housing? What's been your experience with um, finding childcare? What's been your experience with that kind of thing? Um, with the hope experiment, we also have some suggested questions about hope. So things like, what are you hoping for in the, in the next, you know, in the coming year? What are your hopes for this summer? Things like that, where people to really start to share their, their deeper feelings and thoughts and, and learn from one another. And I have found, like Jane was talking about the conversation agreements and how we set those guidelines for ourselves, even if there isn't an agreement with when you're your walking partner or your book group, but you can say to yourself, I'm not going to interrupt this person as they're expressing their feeling. I'm going to give them time to finish their thought and and then I'm going to be interested in in similarities and differences from there. So uh, Rachel's right. We do have a living room conversation in MWEG coming up this this next week. It's on Wednesday, June 26th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, we have two scheduled for uh, July. We have Tuesday, June July 16th from 7 to 8.30 Mountain Time. And Thursday, July 25th from 7 to 8.30 uh, mountain time. Those in July, our topic is politics in faith communities, which is so timely and needed. We need to talk about what what makes us comfortable, what makes us uncomfortable, how can we better engage in important topics within our faith communities. And the topic for June is hope. That's what I yes. that's what I saw. So that works perfect. Um, are, do, do we have any questions? Does anybody have anything else they wanted to add or questions on hosting a living room conversation um, or you want to share their experiences with any like participating in a living room conversation? I don't know. Um, I've done it a couple times and I loved it. Diane, did you want to share? Oh, I thought maybe I saw her on mute. Um, but I, so we put it I just unmuted. Um, oh, I'm, I'm new to MWEG and I've been a little bowled over by how many things there are and kind of unclear about where to start. And I, I attended one living room conversation. It was about immigration and it was awesome because of the, the civility rules were so awesome. And there were maybe 10 people there, including a DACA daughter, I mean, a DACA status including someone else whose mother had been trying to get um, legal immigration status for 10 years and was now facing cancer with many limitations of not having legal status. And someone else who had been, um, she was a retired pediatric physician from um, New Mexico and she lived right by the border. And she had, had, she had such a different perspective because she had this frequent experience of watching big trucks roar by dump a bunch of people out, hungry, thirsty people out in the middle of the desert, and then being on the end of trying to provide care for folks who needed every care, but didn't really, you know, she didn't see it as they belong here. And it was a remarkable experience. And so I'm totally new here, but I really love what you're doing. I love the idea of the Hope Project. 
I love the ground rules that you're setting. I love the idea of a grassroots way to grow hopeful and purposeful things. I also am a recently retired psychologist. I, April 9th was my last day of work. And I'm sort of casting about for purposeful and meaningful things to do with discretionary time. And it's really a great question. <laughs> and so MWEG came up high on my list. So really, mostly that means thank you for what you're doing. I'm still learning to navigate and how to participate. But you have such an impressive host of skills and purposes. And bless you, dear women, for what you're doing. And I'm just kind of tagging along and finding my way. I love that. I'll do my video so I get to say hi to you. I'm multitasking, so I haven't done it all the time. But hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice Thank you. you for sharing that and sharing your experience with your living room conversation. And I will say, I think that you can get overwhelmed with the offerings that MWAG has, be, but um, it's one of those that it's choose your own adventure and see what speaks to you and find the things that are helpful and that you're curious about um, and just take it a little bit at a time. Uh, Becca, did you want to share? I, I was just going to say for me, um, Living Room Conversations is also a social event. So I've had, you know, just a dinner party like outside or try and think of who haven't I talked to in a while or what people would be an interesting combination within my network. And so sometimes I, when you attach the word dialogue, it can seem like something very serious and very heavy. And it can be, you know, you shared some great experiences, Diane, from your conversation on immigration, but really it's just getting into a space where you're, you're able to better understand where people come from. And it can also be really self-reflective. I feel like I learn about myself every time I'm in a conversation because I'm thinking about, oh, what is my relationship to something like immigration or to something like hope? Like, where do I see it? Um, how do I experience it? How can I lean into it more? And so um, I just wanted to offer, it can be as simple as a dinner party or roll it into your next book club, which I did for mine as well. Um, so there are easy ways to do it where it doesn't feel like, there's this weight of organization and the seriousness of dialogue. Um, it's really about connection. Thank you. Yeah. And I was going to add, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I, um, I was at the dentist yesterday morning and in Idaho, your dental hygienist could be a member of the church. And we, um, she just started talking to me about, some trends at BYU that she thought were troublesome and I could tell that she had a different view than I did and but I I I enjoy her and I know her heart and um but um after she shared what she wanted to share I one of my friends taught me to say um I see that differently and so I just shared with her you know I see the things happening at BYU differently because I have a gay son who just graduated from BYU in December and um, it was a hard, it was a hard road for him. And she, she backtracked some of the things she had said. And, but I felt like we left feeling connected and um, that we could share and still love each other and look forward to seeing each other. But um, so I can see the power of, of conversation and also vulnerability. It just, you know, it's hard to say those things when you know that she's seeing it a different way. So I'm interested. I, I wish I could come next week, but I'm going to be at Young Women's Camp. But I, I'll definitely come to one of the ones in July. That would be, I think, really powerful. So thank you. Jane, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to say for those who this is kind of their first time hearing about living room conversations, it's worth a dive to go to their website and just kind of explore. Um, they're so good. It's such a, it's everything's free. It's a free resource and they literally have hundreds of conversation guides. So even if there's a topic around which you're like, I don't even know how to ask the right questions or what would be a good question to enter this conversation with, I'm sure you can find a conversation guide. And then they will have a list of the questions that they use as part of that living room conversation. And it might just give you some ideas of how, what kinds of questions to ask that aren't loaded with language that will presume a certain position. Um, living room conversations and Becca, they're so careful 
about words having meaning. And so there's a neutrality about the way that questions are asked um, that makes it powerful for lots of people with different perspectives to, to feel like they can add value. And I'll also offer that on our website, we have what we call our question of the week. So if you scroll down just on the homepage, there'll be a question of the week and it's a video. It's one of our staff members reading one of the questions from one of our guides and you can click to answer it on video, audio, or via text. And then you can look and see the answers of others. So if you just want like a really quick way to practice the kinds of questions that we ask, you can do that on the website. Um, we also encourage people, you know, you could copy and paste that same question and post it on your social media and see how people answer it. So there are those bite-sized um, ways to kind of dip your toe in and get a feel for what the questions are like. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of these resources. And I love like the question of the day or question of the week that, um, and, and Jane, thanks for sharing that we can just go and look at the questions in advance because sometimes there's, there's topics that we do want to ask friends or family about, but we don't want to come off as um, already having decided on the issues. So this is such a great way to kind of have some questions in mind, like how, how do I ask this or how do I say this? And, um, and Thomas, how you said that, you know, with that hygienist, you said, oh, well, I see that differently. That it, that doesn't nest, it's not combative at all. And that you shared your personal experience of, of why, you know, um, and I think that's part of, part of what living room conversations kind of helps us do is it kind of gives our why, because once you share the vulnerability and your own personal experiences, then it kind of shows people, well, I've had this experience, which is what drives me to feel this way. And, um, and it really does change I, I, the connection that we have with people without necessarily trying to change their minds. And that's what I love about living room conversations is that there's no agenda to change anybody's minds. It's just about understanding and um, connecting with other people with different experiences. So I love it. I love that this is part of our hope experiment and um, I tried to link it, but my computer doesn't like to do zoom in, search the inter internet at the same time, apparently. So I, I will add that um, in NWAG Central with the video for the grows. Uh, we have some other past grows that uh, we kind of reference to in here. If you are interested in looking at some past discussions that we've had or past guests that you can always go to the YouTube playlist for grows or in the MWIC Central, we have a video library that we have been slowly adding some, but I would just invite you all to go and, and kind of see some of the past ones um, on some of those topics. So thank you to Jane for being with us and being our guest and Becca and Catherine um, for sharing uh, more about living room conversations and the hope experiment. And we hope that you will join us next week. We're going to do media literacy, talking about local news sources next week and how you can incorporate that into the HOPE experiment if you're kind of following along and picking different uh, activities or topics to kind of focus on during the summer. That would be a great uh, grow to join us for. And until then, I'll say see you next week. Thank you.